Thank you, uh, Mr. Khatsare, for your very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be amongst such distinguished uh, galaxy of experts. I have a small presentation, and I will see if I can actually share that presentation. See. So I'm uh, required to talk about global cyber law trends. And this is one area that I believe is going to get extremely important as we go forward. And therefore, uh, let's try to, try to see the uh, puzzle as we go forward in this regard. Apologies for the delay uh, because. So first things first, what do I see in the horizon? I see a new paradigm. This paradigm is of attacks. And these attacks are happening all the time. In case if you're not going to these attacks, then clearly you are not necessarily going to be seeing what's happening. I can still find that uh, my slides are still not visible. Uh, sir, it's visible cyber attack. Uh, there is one uh, screenshot uh, showing on, the, on slide, the cyber attacker disrupts service. At okay, so you're seeing it here. Fair enough, fair enough. So bottom line is there is now uh, attacks happening left, right and center. And the quicker the cyber legal frameworks deal with the same, the better it is. Look at the attacks which are uh, done by white hackers, white hat hackers, by black hat hackers. You name it, your tribe may, tribe may be different, but uh, ultimately these attacks are focusing on infrastructure, on uh, governments. And whenever now this political problem takes place, we find that uh, uh, these attacks are the best way forward to disseminate your thought processes. Ultimately, we are now coming a scenario where we can even see chatbots being weaponized. And in these chatbots being weaponized, you're beginning to see a new world that we are living in. Uh, we are all focusing on supply chain digitization, but ultimately it's only a journey, not a destination. Look at mobiles all around and we actually see massive increase in mobile uh, infections and almost everybody's on risk. The attacks have specifically also focused on uh, the cyber security ramifications. Every 11 seconds, one company becomes a victim of a ransomware attack. You look at warfare attacks and you find, wow, you know, it's a different ball game altogether. It's warfare that's happening left, right, and center, and with no international legal frameworks, so as to specifically deal with the same, uh, we find that the cyber legal frameworks are specifically in a, a zone of gray. When I say zone of gray, this is so because I believe that uh, the legal frameworks need to be substantially improving with each passing time. Let's look at the attacks uh, from China. They are ultimately aimed in a particular manner, which is that they are aimed at uh, enhancing the disruption of infrastructure. While all this is happening, quietly a lot of work is happening in the Premier League. Premier League has already filed uh, Web 3.0 and Metaverse trademarks. Do you call hackers friendly? Whether hackers 
can be ethical or not is a different question. But whether they can be friendly or not is also something that we are now beginning to see. Global, one big cyber law trends that I see after cyber attacks is that the governments are saying, let's now focus on cyber reporting. Whether it's America, whether it's Europe, whether it's now India. Everybody wants this reporting to take place. Another big thing that's happening is that at the international level, we are beginning to now see uh, a lot of work happening on a new international convention on uh, regulating cybercrime. And this is the new international convention to regulate the misuse of information and communication technologies for uh, criminal purposes. Ad hoc committee is currently deliberating on a new world, world, new convention, which should potentially be with us in the next about few years but at least the work has begun. Look at how European Union is focusing extensively on a new draft legislation on artificial intelligence. Ukraine has recently now find, uh, signed a new law, which is their virtual assets bill, which legalizes crypto so that they can actually fund the response to the invasion. Look at attack on India. It's happening left, right, and center. Attack, cyber attack on Air, Asia, uh, Air India's data. 4.5 million users' data gone. Attack on official handles. Attack on power grids, nuclear power stations, governmental organizations, corporates, individuals, entities. It's a different ballgame altogether. Digital payments are getting targeted like amazing. Every 11 seconds, one company is becoming a victim of a ransomware attack. So the big trend that I now see is a need for a global approach against ransomware. Already we have in the Netherlands, a program called No More Ransomware. But the legal frameworks, I believe, are clearly not up to the mark on fighting ransomware. The COVID-19 has to be seen in a historical perspective. It's not just a pandemic. It's not just an infodemic. It's also a cyber pandemic. We also need to realize that one big trend that I see on the horizon is the advent of the golden age of cybercrime with the coming of COVID-19. And this golden age is going to be with us for the next many decades. Look at the figures and the advent of golden age becomes even more apparent. 2021, the world lost more than $6 trillion thanks to cybercrime. 2022 end, we should be losing more than $8 trillion thanks to cybercrime. The work from home is a new normal and cyber legal frameworks are not yet fully prepared to deal with work from home. We of course need to be uh, requiring the customization of legal approaches. For example, in the Indian context, the Indian law, law is thoroughly inadequate to deal with work from home. We have been seeing so many cases where people have been stealing corporate data while working from home, misusing the same, and the rise of cybercrime in the context of work from home. So, which is now the new trend? That internet has become the dividing line between digital haves and the digital have-nots. Because almost everybody is today relying on the internet per se. Globally speaking, also I see huge pockets of growth of cybercrime and the inadequacy of legal frameworks in the global context for the purposes of fighting cybercrime. So no wonder countries are now beginning to start realizing, let's now come up with dedicated cybercrime laws so that we can talk about uh, a new world. Why? Because we are entering into a new cyber age where data economy, is the predominant flavor. Data is the new oil of the data economy. And when your data is being targeted by cyber disruptions, by cyber disruptors, the time has come that the focus of cyber law frameworks will have to be on protection of data. On top of it, we have problems of uh, electronic evidence. How do we attribute electronic evidence to a particular state actor or a non-state actor? How do we deal with the intrinsic issue pertaining to uh, this new issue where 
your laws are only applicable within your territorial boundaries? How do you make them applicable to entities outside your country? So one big trend that I see in cyber law framework is that lawmakers are saying, let's start adopting cybersecurity as a way of life. And that has to be the starting point. Why? Because internationally, there are no international laws on cyberspace. There's no international law on cybersecurity. So different countries have already started saying, I am not going to wait. I'm going to come up with my own distinctive national laws on cybersecurity. So look at the list of countries which have during COVID-19 and slightly before, have come up with a variety of uh, national laws on national security, on cybersecurity, whether it's China, Russia, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, Egypt, Germany, Zimbabwe, or even Macau. So the growing color of the landscape on cyber law landscape is being colored by cybersecurity. And somewhere on the line, countries are increasingly realizing that I will have no choices but to come up with dedicated laws or national laws on cybersecurity. Unfortunately, India does not have any dedicated law on cybersecurity. As a country, we did uh, some good work. 2013, we had come up with the national cybersecurity policy. But then it's remained a mere paper tiger. We have not been able to implement it. We are now waiting for a national cybersecurity strategy. But as a student of law, I can clearly tell you the time for strategy is long gone. The time has come where you need dedicated national legal frameworks on uh, cybersecurity. So in India, we wonderfully uh, excel in the idea of knee-jerk reactions. So we don't come up with a national law on cybersecurity. We know that we have a leaking roof during monsoon, but we are trying to repair the leaking roof by putting a Band-Aid. So we now come up with the IT directions 2022. These are now mandating mandatory reporting of cybersecurity breaches within six hours and a variety of other compliances. A lot of other people say these new IT directions are the new lagan that Indians have to pay to the statutory authorities. Because once you become a victim of a cybersecurity breach, you are already below, below the level. You are a victim already. On top of it, if you don't report, you get punished for not reporting. So it's something known as double jeopardy. And such a double jeopardy may not ultimately work very well or very wonderful, wonderfully well. It, instead, it will be much better that we go for more different other approaches. But through these directions, uh, the government is now seeking to come up with cyber security, legal, jurisprudential developments. No diligence on cyber security, computer emergency response team is doing a good job. But I think India requires more. India requires a dedicated ministry on cybersecurity. India requires to learn from the experiences of other countries so that you do not land up reinventing the wheel. You effectively learn from the wisdom of others and come up with your own approaches. Why? Because uh, cyber attacks are happening phenomenally in the Indian context, on Indian networks, critical information infrastructure, corporate networks, private data, Aadhaar, you name it, and everything is uh, under attack. As a nation, we are still giving lip service to AI. But artificial intelligence is now increasingly occupying an important position in the global cyber law trends arena. Why? Because this is becoming one thrust area for different governments to start coming up with their own dedicated national laws on AI. The European Union is now debating on a new law on artificial intelligence. So it's a strange paradigm. You use AI for fighting cybercrime. You use AI for delivering cybercrime. You use artificial intelligence for uh, fighting cybersecurity breaches. You use AI for perpetuating cybersecurity breaches. Another major trend that I see globally is the increased realization amongst nations that it's time that you will have to start regulating and minimally enabling the blockchain ecosystem because blockchain as a technology is now beginning to get 
more mature. So blockchain is not just necessarily bitcoins or crypto assets, it's far more. The extensive use of blockchain in electronic governance across the world is now convincing governments, let's now come up with new uh, legal frameworks on blockchains. Of course, on crypto assets and cryptocurrencies, everybody's uh, holding their judgment back. In the Indian context, the, your, the RBI governor says a crypto asset or a cryptocurrency has less value and a tulip has more value. I think it's more figurative speech. Reality is go to the dark net. And the only way you can make payments is through the crypto assets and cryptocurrencies. So you will have to increasingly start looking at uh, ways on how you can legally recognize crypto assets and regulate their misuse. IoT, no international agreement on cybersecurity and IoT. So hacking and IoT is a child's play. But now we have internet of behavior where your behavioral data from IoT is being used for targeting you. So in a scenario like this, look at what the US is doing. The US has already come up with a federal law on improvement of cybersecurity in the context of internet of things. Look at an IoT dedicated law that's already operating in California for the last two years. So the other day I was in one of the airports in India and I got stopped and I said, look, they have to, they have to map my face. And I said, why? They said, the next time you walk in, we won't stop you. But then India doesn't even have a legal framework for legally recognizing facial recognition. Ukraine is saying we are doing facial recognition of dead Russian soldiers, soldiers so, uh, soldiers and sending photographs of their corpses back to their moms. That's yet another way of using facial recognition. Quantum computing has already arrived globally. In India, it's beginning to arrive. But when this quantum computing is going to break your passwords and authentication mechanisms in a matter of few hours, it's only a question of time before legal frameworks will have to come up with new approaches. And metaverse, is now getting very exciting. Recently, one of our clients have a problem. They have a physical, they have a, a female uh, digital avatar on the metaverse. And that digital avatar has been digitally raped on the metaverse. And now we are exploring options on how we can go ahead and deal with the same. But metaverse is bringing forward new legal policy and regulatory issues. And at uh, the Metaverse Law Nucleus, which we have founded in Delhi, we are working on cutting edge issues pertaining to Metaverse. No reference to global cyber law trends can be complete without referring to the dark net. This is one area where nobody wants to talk about. No wonder legal frameworks are not bothered about dark net. Without realizing that as per one estimate, dark net is about 500 times the size of the superficial net. And somewhere down the line, legal policy and regulatory issues pertaining to darknet will have to be appropriately considered. Video conferencing is our lifeline, but video conferencing is also generating huge legal policy issues, huge electronic evidence output, and huge new challenges and opportunities. Web 3.0 is now bringing forward a new color to the landscape. And therefore the Web 3.0 legalities will increasingly have to be looked into by global lawmakers as they go ahead in developing their cyber law frameworks. The coming of COVID-19 is a death of perimeter security. Now everything is on the edge. All the devices are connecting back on the edge. And therefore edge security will have to play a very, very significant role in the minds of the global cyber law policymakers as they come up with new legal frameworks. Because edge security will have to have appropriate enabling legal support and make a paradigm uh, framework in the context of legalities. Another new trend that I see globally is this growing uh, hunger of countries to go for more, bigger, broader, and comprehensive elements of cyber sovereignty. 
Countries are saying my cyber sovereignty extends not just to my territorial boundaries, but also to the entire internet, to outer space and deep sea waters. And I think this is the Antarctic age version 2.0. When Antarctica was first discovered, countries would send expeditions to Antarctica. They'll go to a particular area of Antarctica, put their flag and say, this is my territory, my law applies. Something similar is happening in cyberspace. Countries are saying, uh, I am now coming up with very broad cyber sovereignty parameters. I'm not even bothered how we'll implement them, but let me nonetheless still uh, come up with very broad provisions. So I think broadly speaking, let's historically see the context of the times in which we live. We are now living in times where we are about to enter into a new cyber age. Because uh, in my new book, New Cyber World Order Post COVID-19, I've argued that by the time the nations of the world are victorious against the current and other uh, subsequent waves of COVID-19 infections, we will enter into a new cyber age where a new cyber world order is awaiting us. States are going to become very powerful. Look at the number of states and the legislations that they passed during COVID-19. They extensively tell you one common thread. States will become extremely powerful. Cyber crime will be the new default option and cyber security breaches will be our daily companion. Therefore, focus will have to be on proactive approaches, on cyber insurance, uh, on trying to come up with other mechanisms to protect your data. Somewhere down the line, we will have to also have changes in professions, specifically the legal profession, the data economy professions. And in that regard, I will have to highlight the need for enhanced capacity building amongst all stakeholders, because without them, uh, and without them being empowered, I don't think we will be able to do this journey successfully. And in this regard, we've already created a platform called cyberlawuniversity.com, where I offer about 36 online courses. These include international certification courses on cyber law, cyber crime law, cyber security law, artificial intelligence law. We've tied up with National Law University Orissa and offer a diploma in cyber law and cyber crime. So I started this as an experiment. I said, look, I'm in a very specialized area of cyber law. Let me see if there's some demand for some cyber law courses. And I was surprised. 27,500 students, 174 countries uh, have done these courses, speaking 52 national languages. These figures are telling us we will have to go for far more enhanced cyber capacity building. And in this regard, my vision was that we should create an international convention, a uh, conference that should be a common melting point for discussion of all elements on the intersection of cyber law, cyber crime, cyber security. That's why 2014, uh, I conceptualized this idea and implemented the International Conference on Cyber Law, Cyber Crime, and Cyber Security. Last nine years, this conference has been going. Uh, its conference, which began with half a day, is now a three-day conference. Thanks to COVID, last two years, we have been virtual. This year also it's virtual, but we should potentially be having one uh, day physical as well. So we get the variety, the creme de la creme of thought leaders, the father of the internet, Sir Vincent, has been uh, meticulously committed to this conference. And every year, for the last nine years, he has been addressing the conference by his video address. We have the creme de la creme of thought leaders in the Indian ecosystem. Uh, in the global environment, in the uh, global cyber age, who have uh, been coming, joining the conference, contributing to its deliberations, and pushing them. And we don't believe it's talk shop that matters. So every year, the conference comes up with an outcome document, which is a coalition of all recommendations, of all uh, major recommendations made in various sessions. And then this outcome document then tends to get circulated globally to all global stakeholders and also all governmental organizations. We have various supporters. The government of India has been a very keen supporter of the conference all these years and its various ministries, apart from various uh, international organizations, more than 130 international organizations over the years have been supporting this conference and uh, have been supporting the vision that we ultimately require a more multi-stakeholder approach when we now deal 
with a very interesting intersection on cyber law, cyber crime, and cyber security. Of course, Artificial Intelligence Law Hub, International Commission on Cyber Security Law, and Cyber Law University are also key strengths and key partners for the conference. So when I head my law firm, Pabundugal Associates, which works on the intersection of law and technology, I can tell you each day is a new day. This is what other people talk about us. But each day we learn something new. And technology is a great master, which tells you, you, you know nothing. And every day I will keep on evolving myself and you keep on following me. So it's a mrigadrishna that is the process that you actually engage in on a daily basis, trying to just find out how things have evolved and how you need to keep on updating. Finally, I like to conclude by saying that today's data-driven world, cyber law plays a very, very important role. We've all become global authors, global transmitters, global broadcasters of data. The world is seeing the great global uh, vomiting revolution. India is seeing the great Indian vomiting revolution, where almost uh, every person is vomiting data pertaining to their personal, professional, social lives. Hence, I think cyber law frameworks will have to keep these paradigms in mind and come up with effective remedies for affected persons in the context of their ventilated grievances in cyberspace and otherwise. It's a fascinating time. It's a work in progress. So if cyber law book was to be written 100 pages in 2030, and we are today in 2022, then out of that 100 pages, we've only written about six or seven pages. The remaining 90 plus pages have yet to be written, uh, written in the next seven or eight years. That will just give you an idea of how quickly the rapid developments in cyber law are going to take place in the coming times. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's a pleasure talking and with that, it's over to the chairperson. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir.